Uh, the project that is, that is being completed and, and, uh, today uh, and, and celebrated is one of the very, very largest that has gone on in the world. So the, uh, if you take the, just the budget and the scale of the project, it is on, uh, almost exactly what it is Google has spent on their whole Google Books project of going and digitizing 20 million books. Um, and it's actually more than everything that the Internet Archive has ever spent on all of its projects. Um, so the scale of what it is that's been accomplished towards digitizing the audio and the video collections of Holland um, is uh, it's of world class. And, and you have now a treasure, a gem, uh, something that's really, um, it, it puts a marker uh, in terms of the, the spirit of, of the investment that the Dutch people are willing to put into this. And now you have also a trading card that you can use in different ways. And I hope that, that you uh, will think broadly about this. I was asked to speak about, well, what next? Uh, what do you do now? How do you go and collect the next era? Not just the, the broadcast materials and the records that have been digitized, but what now? And I'd like to, to uh, use this, this time to go over um, some techniques that you might want to think about for going about collecting the era of the younger people that are never going to put it on discs, they're never going to be on television, yet it's part of our culture. So how are you going to collect that? But also, how do you take the materials that have just been accomplished and make it useful to a generation that really want to have access to it? You may not think they do. You may think it's just scholars. But these old materials are, if they're made available, um, are loved. Um, and it doesn't make the original producers mad. In fact, they're generally happy about it. So I thought I would go over some of our experiences with bringing things online and also how to deal with co uh, materials coming up. And I would like to try to say that an era is changing, that um, if this organization wants to go and collect the next generation's materials, it can't just wait for it to come to them and be in their vault and then go through it later and digitize it and make it available. You have to participate, that you have to create public services that make you part of the conversation in the first place. It's a changed time because we're not creating things on physical materials that last forever. If you're not right there, it will be gone. And I'm going to suggest that this is quite doable. Who am I? I work at an organization called the Internet Archive. Uh, it's a nonprofit library in the United States. Uh, we set out to try to collect uh, the Internet um, and, and make that uh, broadly available. But we found that we needed to move. And maybe this is some of the lesson that might be interesting. So for instance, we started to be an archive of the Internet. So we started by collecting the World Wide Web because it's such a treasure. We wanted to make it so that these pages that last only 100 days before they're either changed or deleted, on average, 100 days, we, you actively need to go and collect them. Um, and then we basically said, ah, really we should be an archive on the internet. So we then took it and made it available again. The lawyers said bad things would happen, but they were wrong. Um, in fact, people love it and they depend on it themselves. Um, so we started to put the materials, the World Wide Web, back online, but we also started collecting television, starting in the year 2000, and then made that available, and movies and music, and I'll go over that. And what we found, actually, this model isn't even working anymore. We need to now build libraries together, that actually it's working inside the communities and being useful to them on their day-to-day -to, -day to make it so that our collections get larger. And I'm going to try to show us some techniques of how we've tried to do this. But I think this is the future of what libraries are. And in fact, it's actually where libraries came from. Because the libraries were always part of the communities. But now, we have these organizations, such as this one, that gets its uh, materials after the fact. This isn't going to work uh, uh, in this going forward time. So to be able to play in this world, you, to, um, you have to give to get. Um, and I think this is a, a, a theme. We see ourselves in the, in the tradition of libraries. I like to look at what people carve in stone. 
just in general, but especially at libraries. So this is what's carved in stone above the door at the Boston libraries is, is free to all. And this was put there by the meanest capitalists the world has probably ever seen a uh, hundred years ago. Um, and, but libraries are special, that they play a role of spreading information and education that I think is important for us to all remember of what our role is um, as some of these issues around what can I give access to, what can I not, what am I allowed. Um, this is the tradition that we are from. So I'm going to go over different types of things that we have worked with and to try to show paths that we have used to go through some of the issues about rights issues um, as well as technology issues. Our, one of our first collections after the World Wide Web was music of live music recordings. These are bands, these are fans that we would record concerts and trade them um, with other fans. And we said we would, um, as a library, we would offer them, and we, we, we wrote this in email, we, we said to this community that was trading, this was back in 2002, we will give you unlimited storage, unlimited bandwidth, forever for free, if you will store things on us. They wrote back, we don't believe you. It's too big. But if you could do it, it would be our dream. Always a good sign when somebody says it would be your dream. So he said, work with us. We get somebody in the band to say it's okay. Not lawyers, just somebody. And that it's okay to have it up. And then uh, the fans started uploading. And we get one or two or three bands every day saying yes. And about 40 or 50 concerts coming up every day. We now have 130,000 concerts from 6,000 bands. And we have everything the Grateful Dead has ever done. It makes us very popular among a particular set um, to have this. But it's a different kind of role for a library where we are just the, the host. We are the shelves for, for them. And it's all worked. And it's worked now for 10 years. We also went backwards. There was a, somebody that collected from before MP3 was standardized, before there was a format, MP3. There was this group that went and put up uh, the under, Internet Underground Music Archive. And there's a fan that went and downloaded all of them and had it on a hard drive. And he showed up about two years ago and said, do you want it? And we said, yes. Um, and so we just took it and we put it up because the company was long gone. And everyone was happy. The founders were happy. The bands were happy. Everybody was happy. If anybody wasn't happy, they'd write to us and we'd take it down. But you know, it didn't happen once. So it, it, uh, it, it worked very well. After CDs started to go down as a way of making a business go, the people started net labels, often that they used to be. And so the Internet Archive played a role of free hosting. Again, we're playing with the community. As the community was evolving, we were there at the same time, not after. And so 2,000 labels said yes, and we have 54,000 albums. We're starting to now deal with real people that produce plastic and trying to find ways to uh, work with them in such a way that it does not decrease their ability to, to sell. We're working with the Archive of Contemporary Music and we're digitizing their collection and merging it with ours. So it's a cooperation between these major archives. We're starting to get donations of materials. Um, for instance, 78 RPM records we got 40,000 of them from a public library. And the reason why they're donating these is because we have a tradition of making things available again. People don't want to just see their, their precious materials go into a basement. They want them accessible. So by being accessible, we're getting support. We're getting more and more support. So we're getting collections. We just got a 50,000 long playing records um, donated as well as the about two million that are in the archive of contemporary music. And we're starting to work uh, with these uh, collections to do mass digitization. So we have now done a volunteer system in two locations. It will probably spread to five or six pretty soon of doing CD digitization. You say CDs, aren't they already digital? Well, not if you're really careful people like we are. To do it exactly right is actually challenging to get the, um, the artwork and the metadata, exactly right, takes work. But the reason why people are doing this 
is they're digitizing their, their version and they put it on the internet archive. If, they, if, it, if they've proven that they have it, either by digitizing it or putting it in and, say, and our, we can check, then they have access to it forever in the future. It's a music locker. So it's a way of getting people to participate, building their own collection, but then everybody else can share it to some extent. If you have digitized it, if it's from your collection, then you have it fully. If it's from somebody else's, only 30 seconds. So that is our way of trying to do it. So that if we can get every library to go through their physical collections, then boink, they get their physical collection made digital. And if somebody else has already digitized it, then it's very quick because it's just boink, it's there. Otherwise, they have to go through and do it. But then at the end of the day, we've moved libraries to digital. And we think that this is a way of doing this in such a way that, well, everybody stays happy, that you're not going to get lawyers, it's not going to be uh, problems, um, that it's, it's understandable of the limitations that, uh, that we're doing. We're doing long playing records as well. Um, it takes these large uh, format scanners. And one community that we're serving are researchers, where these researchers, well, I'll let you read this for a minute. These researchers make computer programs that listen to music, that analyze music. And they just didn't have a big collection to play with. They needed a big collection that had good metadata so that they could teach their, um, their computers what jazz sounds like what hip -hop, hop sounds like. And the way you do that is you give it lots of examples. And so these uh, researchers wanted to have access to large collections. So there are some of our first users is to go over our now 10 or 20 million tracks of commercially produced music and uh, to be able to do their, their work. We've also made listening rooms so that if you physically go into our space or in an, any partner space, you can listen to the whole collection. And again, it's, this is an area that has um, of music and music distribution that tends to be scary um, because of, of all of the fights that have been in this field. But we as libraries, if we're careful, respectful, we can make steps towards making things available 30 seconds at least. If you're inside, if you have physical copies, then you can get digital copies. If you're inside, you can get it. So there are things we can do to try to make things available and we've now yielded to 2 million uh, items in 5,000 collections of different sorts um, of things that are now actively available. These are all publicly available on the internet uh, with no restrictions. And then there's uh, other things um, that are, are more restricted. So music, I'm just trying to go over some of the things that I'm, I'm hoping are, are ways forward for this organization looking forward. Television. We started collecting television in the year 2000 because the Library of Congress was supposed to, but then they just didn't. <laughs> and it was kind of embarrassing. So we, um, so we hit the record button, um, and we started recording Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Iraqi, Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, 24 hours a day, DVD quality, since the year 2000. We're now up to around 70 channels from 25 countries continuously. Um, and then the question is, what could we do with it? So we started by just collecting, just as, as this organization has, but then how can you make it available again? Well, we started by lending. And what does lending mean? Lending means we put an index up on the internet that had only one minute clips. If you wanted the full program, you had to request it from us, we put it on a DVD, we send it, and then you have to send it back in 30 days. Lend it. Um, but the index, for many people, is good enough. Actually, it's a minute. So sometimes they just take these little clips and put it in their blogs. We use the words that they said based on uh, closed captions, uh, transcripts of the, uh, that's automatically broadcast in the United States because of, of uh, the hard of hearing. We use that so people could search on what people said and find the clips that they wanted. There are now 400,000 programs up and it's working just fine. So it's just United States television news, but this uh, way of lending has been working out uh, just fine. So you can search, find when it occurred, Snowden uh, uh, in this particular case, and it's working. 
Another thing that we've done with television that's just been announced a couple of days ago is we're trying to help inform the United States populace about what the effect of having unlimited money in our elections is. So in 2014, we did a, a, a trial program in the Philadelphia region um, to go and record all of the television and then um, uh, find all of the political ads. And I have a very depressing statistic that based on a very large sample, um, the ratio of time of political ads during television news and then news about the elections or about the candidates, 45 to 1. 45 times more time in, in adver political advertising than in political news, which is depressing. But hopefully it's going to help inform um, the populists or the regulators that actually unlimited money is a problem. Moving images. Most people think of it as Hollywood. Uh, we don't have very much of that up on the public internet, but we do have a lot of the types of things that you have in your collection, and making these available has been very, very popular. Also, we allow people to upload things, and that works very well. And then we just, if anybody gets mad, we take them down. So it's notice and take down. Uh, we have also equipment kind of like yours, um, and we have even been doing a lot with videotapes. So videotapes, they all have rights issues. Um, and so we got better at digitizing these. Um, what we would do is we would look to see if any of the videotapes were available for sale as DVDs. If they were not, we digitize it, make it available on the net. And this is a balance that seems to work. And it's cheap enough uh, to do even at very large scale. I know that this is sound and vision, but let me give uh, another example of lending that has worked very well. We want to get everything from the Library of Congress up online such that it can be seen on lots of different kinds of devices using fairly primitive scanners that are now being scanned in many, many places. We have um, uh, been getting rare Korean books. Uh, we're digitizing in Beijing and even in uh, Bali. Um, where we now have a collection of everything the Balinese have ever written. Um, but when they read it, actually, you get these really cool things where there's actually uh, the way that they read them is shadow puppets or dances. So when we've been looking for complete things to put online, the Balinese said yes, which is, I think, quite amazing. And we've been digitizing a lot. But the way to view this, I think, is how do you go and make available things that are in copyright where you do not have permission? And what we've done with Open Library is a new website, is we have libraries lend books that they have um, digitized. So this is libraries, put forward at least one book, non-rights cleared, and 1,000 libraries have done this digitized without permission so that they can open up access in their library to all of our books of 300,000 books so you can borrow a book. What does it mean to borrow a book? You go, this might, book might be checked out. This is a book that we purchased, but it's checked out. And you can add it to your list. Here's a book that's not as popular um, from the Boston Public Library, a modern book that's not, not rights cleared, digitized. And you say, okay, I can borrow it. And you check it out, and then you can read it for two weeks. And during that time, no one else can read it. So it's, a, it's acting like a library in the digital world. You say it's clunky, sort of awkward. Yes, but nobody's mad at us, which is a good thing. Um, so how do, where the Google project got stopped, um, we haven't been stopped. So this is a way of moving, uh, moving forward. Software. We have 90,000 titles, and we've even been able to make it so you can run them in your browser. So this is um, Microsoft um, operating system, old DOS games, that you can actually boot and run in your browser. It's kind of surreal. Anyway, it's very popular, because I guess a lot of people spend a lot of time on these games, and they go, oh, I haven't seen this game. And they love it, and, and people aren't mad. And, and the people that are mad, and there are some, um, because like Pac-Man or, or like, they uh, say, well, 
they uh, are still selling it, and we just take it away. So if we just sort of bend, not break, it works very well. Um, we're probably best known for the World Wide Web um, and collecting everything that we can on the World Wide Web and making it available again. So this is what Yahoo looked like in 1996. Pets.com with the little sock puppet. Bad old library catalog, uh, catalogs. And um, there are some of our users have shown us reasons for us. This was a, a, a snapshot of a press release from the President of the United States being on an aircraft carrier saying mission accomplished, that the uh, combat operations in Iraq have ended. Yet two days later, they changed the press release to say that major combat operations have ceased. They didn't tell anybody they were changing the press release. And if there was nobody recording it, there would have been no record. So we need these things to not only be um, recorded at the time, but we need them to be available immediately. Another example of working together in the World Wide Web area is we now have a, a tool to help people work together. An example is when the uh, Japanese uh, tsunami hit. Within two hours, we were working on it, and we had people all over the world suggesting different uh, sites. So um, it was very important to the Japanese so we archive things that are no longer there. Archive things that are no longer there. And this is a way of, of working together to make it uh, all happen. And we presented it back to the National Diet Library. So it's a way of working together immediately, which I think is the only way to go. Next up is going to be personal digital archives. So where many of our families, things are in boxes, or maybe they're on a hard drive, but now they're probably most likely to be on Flickr or on Google someplace or some, just someplace. Um, that's where our, our memories are. If we are not proactive in, in getting those, we will never get them. But we won't get them because these are personal. They have passwords. How can we work as institutions to help people collect their memories? so that they exist for a uh, uh, hundred years from now. It's not going to be by waiting for it. It's going to be being in there and working with uh, people. Universal access to all knowledge. I believe it is one of the great things that our generation can offer to the world. It will be up there with the Library of Alexandria or the Gutenberg Press. Um, but it is everyone's mission to be able to make uh, all of this uh, come true. And at last, carved above the door of the library, uh, the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh, again, one of those capitalists, was free to the people. Thank you very much.